You know, when you watch shonen anime long enough, you start feeling like you've seen it all. The desperate last, actually final, for real this time, stand against the big scary monster dudes final form part two season three. The amoral rival gloating about how awesome it is to be a d**khole all the time, but then the hero comes in shouting, nuh-uh, friendship's better, and tears him a new d**khole with his Beyblade or whatever. Which, I mean, if you're a little shonen goblin like me, is exactly what you're here for. You'll gobble up anything Mommy Jump puts in front of you so long as it opens up with a high-pass fight reel set to something by Lisa or Kanaboon or Asian Kung Fu Generation. It's just, sometimes you can't help yearning for something a little different, you know? Like, what if Porno Graffiti did more OPs? I love Porno Graffiti as much as I apparently hate being monetized. But then, all of a sudden, from out of left field, in comes Tatsuya Katani to dropkick Jujutsu Kaisen joyers everywhere right in the fields with his Anohana ass ode to summer's long past and loved ones long departed titled Where Our Blue Is. <laughs> which somehow managed to be all that and also simultaneously the hypest shonen action anthem this year. Until they got a new one five episodes later that was somehow even hype-er. <laughs> Both of these openings are absolutely phenomenal from a music and production standpoint, and I can only imagine how excited anime onlys must have felt watching them for the first time. I can only imagine it because, as a manga reader, all I could feel watching these things was pain. Today, we're gonna talk about that pain and all the beautiful artistic techniques this anime uses to evoke it. Mostly in that first OP, because it's totally manga spoiler safe at this point, and also just kind of a straight up masterpiece, but the second one was clearly made as the red to its blue version, so this discussion wouldn't be complete without tackling both of them, and we're gonna cover that one after a spoiler warning at the end of the video. Before we can get into any of that though, please enjoy this quick word from today's sponsor. But how I hit you right in the core. Simple, I redirected my cursed energy to mask my core's true location. You mean like how ExpressVPN lets you reroute your internet traffic through their high-speed servers in whatever country you want, thus protecting your identity and true location while simultaneously granting access to region-locked foreign content. Wow, fella, it's exactly like that. I got the idea when I needed to torrent to terabyte of zebra porn in the Jujutsu High door. ExpressVPN's end-to-end -end encryption is exceedingly useful for stopping network admins from snooping in your personal business, sending you warning letters over torrents, or finding incriminating evidence in your outgoing mail. Oh? What are you so worried they'll see? Uh, I am addicted to sexting. Robots do that? I am not a robot. I am a cursed bubble boy who remote pilots robot-like magic puppets from the comfort of my filthy bathtub. Everyone's got problems, bub. I didn't ask for your life story. I just wanted to gush about how cool, futuristic, and convenient it is that if it were physically possible for a talking panda to visit the US or Canada, I could still watch shows that aren't out there yet, such as the latest seasons of One Piece or Demon Slayer, right on Japanese Netflix. So Sometimes I set my location to Hawaii just to pretend. Yeah, ExpressVPN sure is great. Not a day's gone by since I got three months free by going to expressvpn.com slash basement that I don't think about how reliable and shockingly fast their service is. Agreed. I also got my free three months by clicking that link, which is located in the doobly-doo. Say, oh, this has given me another great idea. Let me borrow your phone. Wait. Wait, stop. We can think of a more creative gag to end on than meaningless violent- ah, The pain. Where Our Blue Is opens on some kind of droplet fallen through the darkness to make ripples that eventually coalesce into Satoru Gojo, settling down for his flashback nap in a very expensive chair. That droplet could be interpreted a lot of ways, but I think it's a lone tear that Gojo is shedding for his long-lost one true shonen rival, Suguru Geto. And I think that because Kitani has gone on record that he wrote this song about Geto 
from Gojo's perspective. As Gojo starts fading, we crossfade to a bird's eye view of his office, in which Easter egg enjoyers will want to note these files, probably for all the new grade one sorcerers who've just been nominated at the end of last season, as well as these flowers, which we saw Gojo carrying to what seemed like a funeral in the last OP. Come to think of it, I never actually covered Vivid Vice, so while I got this on screen, take a sec to check out how none of the raindrops are reaching Gojo thanks to his infinity power. That's really neat. Also, I suspect the flowers are for Ghetto, in part because he's the only guy we know of who's died recently other than Yuji, and in part because right after we see them in the new OP, the shot we do a sick upside-down transition to shows Ghetto walking away from Gojo in the same outfit he wore in front of that KFC. What's more, he's walking away into the light. He's dead, Jim. And if that's not making you emo enough already, the hallway he's walking away in just happens to be the infinite one that you need to run in opposite directions to get out of. Ah, my feelings. And it only gets worse from here. I mean, we don't even get a break on the title card. It does seem like everything's gonna be chill, but then all of a sudden, these exactly two doves fly out of the corner for a fucking your lie in April ass symbolic jump scare. From there, we pan down out of the sky to a actually really cute little sequence of Gojo and his school friends running to catch a train. And here, the OP's doing something really neat by showing us a part of these characters' lives that the anime itself doesn't ever have time for, namely the happy part. And with animation alone, it actually manages to convey quite a bit about their personalities and their friendship that the show doesn't have time for. Like, Shoko starts sprinting for the train the second they reach the station, showing that she's kind of a warrior, whereas Ghetto only half commits to his light jog. Gojo basically skips the whole way, projecting his trademark unbothered aura. Nanami, for his part, doesn't really have the energy to be bothered, keeping up a steady pace that he only breaks at the last second to pick up time in the most efficient way possible by lazily taking the platform stairs two at a time. Meanwhile, his exceedingly genki fellow first year and best friend Hybara is shown running ahead to talk to a different person in every single shot of this sequence like some sort of excited puppy. And in the process, he somehow manages to fall back from the front of the pack outside the station to be the last one onto the platform stairs in the next shot, which he then proceeds to hop down three at a time like some sort of maniac. And then he still turns around to jabber with Gojo some more as the doors are shutting at the very last second. You know, looking at this idiot, it's actually really easy to tell why Nanamin took such an instant shine to Yuji. As they step onto the train, we see Riko, the star plasma vessel, stepping off of it in the background. Then when she turns to look at the rowdy teens, we're hit with an actual jump scare, a Junji Ito reference that is, of course, the exact spot where Riko will eventually be shot in the head and Ghetto's whole life will eventually start falling apart. But hey, don't think about that right now. Look at how cute and funny this core friend trio is. Each of them cool-looking character cards back there was lifted from the cover of Chapter 66, whereas this cute little animation in front is all anime original. We see Gojo looking all bored till Ghetto shows up, then they start beefing over which one's more basic baby girl, but then when Shoko arrives, their frowns immediately turn upside down and everyone's pals again. It's a fantastic encapsulation of their whole friend dynamic, I assume because, I mean, we barely get to see them actually hang out in the show itself, which kind of makes it weird that the OP focuses so hard on their whole Naruto squad deal. Almost like we're watching an OP for a different, full-length young Gojo anime that never got made. A memory that never happened, if you will. I suppose Nanamin and Haibara must have gotten more screen time in that non-existent anime, too, because here they are once again, Haibara once again running ahead to maintain eye contact, which is very cute, but, uh... Notice how when he runs ahead, he runs into the light and then stops, whereas Nanamine keeps walking down a path of darkness. He's dead, Joe. The next shot gives Kyoto High Girls Mei Mei and Utahime some much-deserved love, telling us essential things about their characters, such as how Utahime is just the easiest target on the entire planet, and Mei Mei 
is a shameless bully. Speaking of bullies, lastly we see Toji Fushiguro at the horse track with his closest friend, the guy who pays him money to kill people, sitting 30 feet apart and not making eye contact because they're not gay. Also Toji's asleep and looks kind of annoyed to be woken up, even if it is with an offer of cash for murder. Also note how he instantly hones in on Kong's presence, showing his sharp senses and reflexes. Not to mention his muscles. This shot clearly demonstrates that he has a lot of them and they are quite big. Kind of a running theme in this OP, actually. On that note, the next little montage seems to be a symbolic retelling of what Toji does to Ghetto and Gojo's relationship. One clap, we see Ghetto smiling as he thinks about Gojo. Two claps, and Gojo's thinking nice thoughts right back at him. But then, a third pair of hands comes clapping in between them, and suddenly, the framing shifts. Now they're facing apart, both of their expressions hidden from view, and the soft, warm, nostalgic light that once framed both of them now sits between them with only darkness lying ahead on either of their diverging paths. And when Ghetto swallows this here curse symbolizing his feelings of resentment toward us filthy monkeys, he confirms which of those paths he'll be heading down. If we roll back a sec to this last shot of him though, we can actually see another more subtle hint of his future heel turn. The last keyframe of his smile here is undeniably hopeful and innocent, but for a couple frames leading up to it, when his hair falls over his eye and his face is buried in shadow, he looks positively villainous. Meanwhile, if we look at the animated subtleties of Gojo's matching expression, the way that he almost sheepishly touches his neck as a soft smile plays across his lips suggests that, uh... Okay, look, I know this is gonna be contentious with a certain contingent of shonen fan bros who despise all forms of shipping, but they f***ing. Or possibly they both really wanna be f***ing, but they can't find the right way to say it, and also Gojo would never lose his virginity because Gojo never loses, so everything ends up going to shit before either of them gets to confess. There's a lot of ways to interpret their relationship, but all of them are tragic and none of them are straight. Like. Yeah, I guess you can say it's a little ambiguous, but so's Witch from Mercury and Tiger and Bunny. You can buy official matching Satosugu rings for Gojo's sake. They f***ing. in. Okay, look, if you're still in denial, remember how this song was written about Ghetto from Gojo's perspective? <laughs> yeah, sorry, there is just no heterosexual explanation for that. And actually, I'm not sorry, because the romantic dynamic of their relationship makes the whole story so much better and adds a ton to rewatches. Once you realize that Ghetto is the only person Gojo ever truly loved and vice versa, besides their respective adopted kids of course, there's suddenly a whole new layer of emotional weight behind stuff like Ghetto going ape shit when he thinks Toji killed Gojo, not to mention when Gojo says, <laughs> And, of course, everything that happens in the movie. Speaking of, the next shot of the Naruto trio shows them happily strolling down the exact street where Gojo will one day find and kill his, quote, best friend, his one and only, after Ghetto's fight with Yuta. And if that's not enough of a twist of the knife for you, when the shot stops tracking in, cutting Gojo's friends out and leaving him all alone, Toji pops up right behind him, right next to his neck, taking his own much more menacing looking stroll down the barrier your path to Jujutsu High to twist a literal knife all up in that neck. Then, of course, he's gonna kill a teenage girl for a lot of money, which is also, of course, what's symbolized in these next shots of Riko dramatically sinking into her extremely fancy bathtub as a seamless transition of cursed energy surges up to meet her. That is, unless the shots represent how she would have lost herself by merging with Tengen, as symbolism goes, this is just ambiguous enough to not spoil what it's pretty obviously spoiling. In other words, it's ideal anime opening imagery. What's not ambiguous is how the split-screen transition to the big fun fight scene declares loudly and proudly that Gojo and Ghetto are here, they complete each other, and 
you better not get used to it, actually. You are this whole little fight scene is just an absolute delight to watch. There's so many little details in the choreography and animation as characters chase each other between the foreground and background. Not only do Ghetto and Gojo's personalities and skill sets shine through in basically every shot, but even the random mooks that they're fighting all get to do something different and memorable. Plus, it's got fun little Easter eggs like Ghetto's cute nose goblin guy from the movie zipping around, helping him fight alongside his pink manta curse. And despite how much it has going on in every shot, the individual frames of those shots are beautifully composed. There's also some potentially very heavy foreshadowing in the fact that Ghetto's big dragon is fighting a giant demon axolotl when it's generally agreed on by fans that axolotls are Yuji Itadori's spirit animal. But I digress. The best thing about this fight is how we get to enjoy Ghetto and Gojo fighting together, synergizing their powers, having each other's backs, which is another memory that sadly never happens in the anime or manga. In the actual story, they just clean up these Q goons on their own off screen between episodes. And that's a bummer because their dynamic together here is super fun. But of course, fun isn't the point of this OP. The point is pain. So eventually the chaos gives way and for a brief glorious moment, all the camera can see is Ghetto handsomely styling on a motherfucker, which it then pulls back to reveal Gojo's baby blues staring at intently. <laughs> If you can find a heterosexual explanation for that, there is a job waiting for you at Bandai Namco. On that note, the next thing we see is this random little gag of Yaga Sensei sending both them dummies flying for being dummies in goofy slow motion over the lyrics in such a color as if it were a silent love. While you're thinking on the obvious implications of that, if we rewind and focus on the foreground of that gag before Shoko smacks Haibara, the way that she's holding her hands over his limp, beaten body almost like she's trying to use her healing powers while Nanamine stands behind them unable to look subtly foreshadows the Genki young man's eventual fate. She's dead, Jim. Now, even going through them frame by frame, I wasn't able to spot any similar dark implications in the next few shots of buddies hanging out. Just some very funny and cute expressions on Rico's friend group's faces. A perfect visual metaphor for the cold standoffish way that Nanamine shows affection. And lastly, some more beautifully animated allegations that Gojo and Ghetto are absolutely never beating. If you can think of a heterosexual explanation for this, you missed your calling writing 90s anime dubs. But even these unambiguously happy images have a bittersweet aftertaste, since we know that they're all long gone memories of better times, if they're memories that happened at all. We see Toji cast aside yet another losing bet as he goes to end those good times in the very next shot. And the shots that follow it paint a stark contrast between how Riko consciously chooses to spend her last day on Earth and the futile gambling that he unwittingly wittingly chose to waste his on. The second last sequence of the OP depicts Rico and her three guardians enjoying a last fleeting moment of peace and happiness as the sun sets on their little unplanned trip to Okinawa. Rico skips ahead with some real Ghibli Genki girl energy, prompting eternal worrywart Kuroi to give chase while Gojo and Geto happily hang back, the former flashing a cocksure grin while the latter matches it with a playful, exaggerated, here we go again type sigh. The next OP will mirror both these shots in its efforts to cause you even more agony. But if that's still not enough pain for you, the theme lyrics are here once again to do the opposite of save the day. <laughs> According to Kitani, those are what he believes Gojo's unheard last words to Ghetto were in the movie. Which would almost certainly be the most emo thing in this whole very emo song, if not for how the OP ends. <laughs> The 
As Gojo's hand moves to cover his face in grief and obscure his view of the heavens, we see fleeting glimpses of his high school life. Kicking back in the midday sun with his new first year classmates, bullying Utahime on the afternoon of their first Kyoto exchange event, throwing an evening welcome party for the new students the following year, leaving as the sun sets on maybe their last day, a wall now standing between him and Ghetto. Finally, the classroom sits empty in the red hue of dusk. Not only is this sunset motif a beautiful and poignant way of capturing those last lost moments of innocence and adolescence for these characters, it's also a perfect transition from this bright and sunny OP into the dim and dusky one that follows. Compared to what we were just analyzing, Special by King New is a much simpler, more straightforward opening, a basic yet highly effective hype reel for the Shibuya arc, full of sly references to soon-to-be iconic scenes and slow-mo pose-offs between the opposing sides of the coming conflict, like a roster reel for anime WrestleMania, which is all it really needed to be. I mean, Shibuya is the most epic shonen action event since the Chimera Ants. Simple as it is, this OP is undeniably top tier. It just doesn't give me all that much to work with vis-a-vis -vis this whole video essay thing, beyond, you know, pointing out all the spoilers it has hiding in plain sight. Which is fun, but if you're an anime only and it's not December yet, that is what I'm gonna be doing for the next rest of the video, so probably wait till December to watch more, or you could just read ahead. That's also a great option, but whatever you do, if you're not caught up to the end of Shibuya yet, I would highly recommend that you pause this video now and Please and thank you, come back to finish it once you are. Now that I've said that, every extra second of this video is a view retention liability, so let's start talking spoilers. After we get through the first 10 seconds or so, that is, which show everyone who's in the upcoming arc making their way along a temple path like some kind of festival or funeral procession, or maybe a war march. There aren't any spoilers in these shots beyond who's going to be fighting, but there is some cultural symbolism in everyone leaving the sacred protection of the Tory Gate, indicating that heroes and villains alike are putting their lives on the line in the coming battles, but only two of the five shots have any deeper meaning beyond that. The first one, of Yuji turning back to face us before following the parade, highlights that this is his, and a lot of other people's, last chance to turn back, which of course, none of them take. And, of course, this shot parallels the split screen from the last OP in the saddest way imaginable. Though, fair warning, the imagery only gets more ominous as we head into the title card. Okay, the first shot under the title seems innocent enough, just an unusually red view of Shibuya scramble, but then the camera starts panning down into the depths of the underground station where nothing good is gonna happen. The first not good thing we see is all these civilians getting sucked down there from the street, though it does look quite good with this whole Virtual Boy slow-mo aesthetic. That's followed by a shot of an onusa, a wooden wand used in Shinto purification rituals, surrounded by swaying banners, more festival imagery, which in turn gives way to this sketchy animation of a hatching cocoon, symbolizing the moment in his fight with Yuji where Mahito finally ascends to his true form. Then, as we reach the bottom floor of the subway, we see the prison realm embedded in the tiles at Pseudo Ghetto's feet, and the camera follows Gojo into its pitch black eye, transitioning the OP into yet another series of cool and dramatic, but not particularly meaningful roster shots. Starting with just about the most nightmarish blunt rotation of Jujutsu High staff and students imaginable, and ending with a very cool 3D effect shot of all the curses waiting to ambush Satoru in the tunnel. Speaking of, he of course shows up again in the middle of this sequence, looking all serious as he struts alone down the crowded street to Shibuya Station. Actually, just about everyone in this sequence looks all serious, like, all the time, which is kinda my only complaint about it. The animators put so much effort into making everyone look all stoic and badass at a very smooth frame rate that very little individual personality ends up coming through in the animation. Like, 
Here, the only really meaningful body language from any of these many characters is the one dirty look that Maki shoots her dad right at the start. The one exception to this lack of personality is, of course, Mahito, who looks to be having an absolute hoot as he skips through a passenger train, Cronenbergen up the joint. These shots really sell his essential charm as a villain, the eternally playful eagerness to seize each new day, try new things, and hurt new people whenever he can, like an evil monkey D. Luffy. I guess you can count Pseudo Ghetto's evil grin at the end of the tunnel as personality too, but all that really tells us is he's got some wicked plans cooking. One of those plans is set into motion as Jogo unravels an Uber Eats delivery of ten fingers for Korone, which he then accidentally delivers to Yuji. This causes our hero to writhe about in a daze amid a haze of shadows from countless passers-by, his own shadow shifting out of sync with his body as Sukuna prepares to kill all those off-screen civilians. The J-horror vibes continue with a shaky handheld shot of a camera whipping around to reveal fragments of some horrid old prophecy on a faded ancient tapestry, foretelling the arrival of Dagon, Jogo, Hanami, and Mahito, and reminding us of how ancient and godly these villains really are. Speaking of godly, the next guy we see is Aoi Toto, kissing his locket as he squares off with Mahito's Cronenbergs in a shot lifted straight from the manga. Next, his Kyoto classmate Mekamaru makes a Mother F and Ava reference as he also prepares to get his ass kicked by Mahito, which ultimately prompts Miwa to cry as she clutches his precious parting message to her chest. The next shot of Yuji turning into Tsukuna, in addition to being absolutely badass, is definitely the internet's favorite part of this OP. Out of context, it's ideal meme fodder for when you're, for instance, losing an argument on the internet, but then you notice a dove in the other guy's profile. As far as its meaning in context goes, the flames and cocky grin are clearly an allusion to Jogo's very one-sided fight with Sukuna, although the gross mouth that the camera flies out of at the start is probably a reference to the mouth that Mahito hides in to sucker punch Yuji in their fight, and that's after he turns back, so it's kind of a confusing shot. But but there's no confusion as to what the next shot shows, despite how abstract the animation here gets. That is clearly the ocean of corpses spat out of Dagon's mouth as he transforms from a cute little octopus guy into a big scary octopus man. Which is, um, actually not what a Dagon is, Mr. Akutami, sir. That's clearly a Cthulhu you've drawn there, but... I digress. As the wall of water rushes forward, we can see Naobito Zenin, Maki, and Nanamine fighting the current to varying levels of success, and both these shots really impress with the polish and energy of their animation. But this next one of Yuji and Toto Tarzan sliding at Mahito blows them both out of the water. This shot is just Sakugatastic, perfectly capturing the personality and techniques of all three fighters. The two sketchy black and white impact frames that hit when Toto claps and swaps in time with the beat, of course, are just juicy. I love this effect. And the way the shot ends with Yuji leaving his besto friendo behind to face old patch face one on one subtly foreshadows how the full fight will eventually go down. Speaking of spoilers hidden in plain sight, the next nine shots are basically just a bunch of those, each one gorgeously animated with that stylish red mood lighting. Starting with Jogo, who freaks out and flames on for his fight with Sukuna, then Choso, who freaks out under the sprinkler that Yuji activates in their fight as our hero's as yet unexplained curse technique, quite possibly the literal power of friendship, floods his mind with memories that never happened of them being long lost brothers, just like how Yuji brainwashed Toto. The next shot has to hide its subject's identity in shadow since, you know, it's Obviously a pretty big spoiler that Toji comes back, but once you know that spoiler, the fact that he's upside down makes it pretty obvious. And the shot after that is just as obviously the moment Yuji's attacked by Pseudo Ghetto right after his fight with Mahito. Mei Mei certainly looks badass with her huge ass axe slung over her shoulder and all her crows exploding all over the place here, although the effect is somewhat diminished when you remember that she totally runs away from her big fight down in that tunnel. Once again, to avoid spoilers, the person being charbroiled by Jogo over here is also hidden from view, although if you look closely at his right hand, you can just barely make out the shape of Nanami's cleaver amid the flames. Uh -huh. 
He's dead, Jim. Sad shit indeed, but the shit gets even sadder as we watch Megami square up against the undead psycho murder hobo that he never realizes was his own estranged father. And if you think that's tragic, check out this shot of Nobara surrounded by chairs, representing the limited space she leaves in her life for friends and loved ones, all of them empty, just like in the vision that she has when Mahito gets his hand on her. And of course, her hand is covering up the same eye that he, you know, does the thing to. Did Kurudisaki just die? You know, it was really unclear. And as much as I want to keep the cope alive for Best Girl, her prospects here really do not seem good, considering the next shot shows Jujutsu Dr. Shoko, who might have been able to save Kugisaki, but quote, don't get your hopes up, slumped over a chain link fence for a depressed smoke. Which is technically a reference to an earlier moment in Shibuya that has nothing to do with Nobara, but yeah, really just feels like they're saying it's Gojover here. Speaking of, the last spoiler of this spoiler montage is, of course, the scene where Gojo gets sealed in the prison realm, specifically the moment where he sees Ghetto and all the memories come flooding back all at once. Note how his eyes have already lost their blue luster due to the cube sapping his powers. This leads into a very cool abstract animation sequence where the hand signs for various curse techniques and domains seamlessly morph into each other in front of abstract backgrounds representing those techniques. First, Sukuna's malevolent shrine, then Mahito's idol transfiguration, Dagon's horizon of the captivating Skanda, Jogo's disaster flames, and Choso's convergence surrounded by spears of blood. Toto, appropriately, gets the coolest moment, at least from an animation standpoint, his hands clapping along with the beat as they keep teleporting to catch up with the camera. The next hand sign is Megami's, specifically the one he uses to summon his most OP Shikigami, Maharaga, which he can't actually control yet. This is his big desperation move. Literally him saying, I'm gonna kill myself and then you. And while the first time we actually see him use it is here in Shibuya, if you pay attention, you'll notice Megumi almost does it a lot in season one, like in both his fights with Sukuna and when Toto called him boring. Like, deadass, he was gonna end it all right there if Panda hadn't stepped in. Much like the last one, this montage also ends on Gojo, with the hand sign for Unlimited Void nestled between his beautiful baby blues. As they flash open, the power of infinity expands our perspective so we can see all of Tokyo, with the camera slowly zooming in on Shibuya. Then it's time for one last twist of the knife, with those last two shots of Ghetto and Gojo mirroring the last OP, leading into one last roster shot of everyone from Jujutsu High lined up looking all badass in the center of Shibuya. Except Gojo, of course, he's a little tied up right now, and Yuji, who's left alone and forever changed at the end of the arc and the opening, staring off at a hard-earned sunrise as he works up the courage to turn away in an inversion of the very first shot and walk away into the city and on toward the future battles of the Culling Game arc. And that's it. Like I said, it's a pretty simple opening, but a very effective one for what it's trying to accomplish, which is getting Jujutsu Kaisen fans who don't know what's about to happen properly hyped for it, while reminding those of us who do know of all the ways it's gonna hurt all over again. I'm Jeff Thu, professional Jujutsu Kaisen enjoyer, and if anyone out there knows where Gege Akutami is hiding, I just wanna talk, man. Don't worry about it.